one thing that's interesting um, in having the type of practice that I have, which is, again, not the ordinary music lawyer practice, is that you run into different rights issues. Um, you know, a record deal is a record deal in many respects. A producer contract is a producer contract. A publishing contract is a publishing contract. So it's not necessarily as dramatically different from the basic deal point of view. The, so I, I wouldn't want to mislead anybody watching this tape and, and saying, my gosh, I could never do a, br a British contract because I don't know British law. But there are certain things that you'd need to know. For example, um, um, American record contracts are typically six, seven, eight album deals. Um, in England, there are, there's rules called restraint of trade where you could never have an eight album deal. A court would throw it out. So that is a distinction that... Uh, but, it, you know, it, that's just knowing you can't have it that long. It doesn't mean that the, the entire structure of the deal is different. There's just certain little limits that, certain big limits, as the case may be, um, that um, um, might apply in one territory versus another. There are also um, the, the major difference that <clears throat> you have European lawyers having a hard time with and American lawyers not understanding is the way that the mechanical royalty payments are made. Now in the record business, <coughs> it's a very complicated set of uh, royalty um, um, payouts. There's two separate streams of income. Uh, there's the income that you uh, share in when the record sells. So if you bought a record at Tower Records or if you didn't steal it offline, children. Um, um, if you bought a record for fourteen ninety eight, the artist gets a percentage of that price. Okay, that's what you, everybody thinks of as, as the um, uh, the record royalty. There's another royalty called the, what we call mechanical royalty, and that is payable to the songwriters. So, for example, if I were to do a Beatles cover album with my acoustic guitar, with my horrible voice, singing voice, and sell it uh, at Tower Records for twelve, and people were to buy it, I would get the percentage of that twelve ninety eight because it's my recording. I sold it. It's, you're buying my version of that song. However. Lennon and McCartney are getting paid the mechanical royalties because it's their, it's their songs. They're not my songs. I'm singing somebody else's songs. So that's the music publishing, and that's what we call mechanical royalties, um, which goes back to the old when they used to actually mechanically, you know, uh, press the records, and that was the right to do, to, to mechanically reproduce sound recordings, and that's where that word came from. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, for example, in Europe, there are collection societies in, on a country by country basis who collect the mechanical royalties from record companies and they set the mechanical royalty uh, rate as a percentage of the retail price and the, the local collection society will collect on behalf of the writers and then pay it out and so forth whereas in America Congress every two years because America loves bureaucracy um, changes the mechanical royalty rate it's it's on a it's on a different completely different calculation basis there is no cap unless you negotiate one in the record deal and it's and there is although there are similar societies here that collect there's not a legal requirement to use those societies so you have a completely different set of rules governing a very fundamental and very uh, um, um, important part of uh, the revenue stream of selling records.